Look at what just came in the mail. And boy, am I excited for this one. That really hits the spot. Yup, that is a dedicated Japanese catalog book for the PlayStation Portable. It has exactly what it says. Commentary and photograph for all fans. It took a couple weeks to get here. The total came around to 50 US dollars from eBay, shipped directly from Japan. And if you're wondering, this was actually released back in 2021, so it's pretty recent. So let's go ahead and find out if this thing is as awesome as it looks. First things first, of course, this only comes in Japanese. Yes, it does exist for other different consoles. One of the ones I'm pretty interested in is the Sega Genesis, so I'll eventually get my hands on that. However, for a couple things here and there, we'll use Google Translate and give you guys an idea of what's being said here. And right down here is telling us something about how awesome it is as our multimedia pocket machine. This cover right here is removable, which will leave us with a sleeve, which when removed will leave us with a finish like this, which is honestly pretty clean and I really dig it. Right here we got a biography about the author and the Twitter handle. All right, so let's finally open it up and take a look at what we have here. So right here we have what it claims to be the perfect catalog. We start off with the 1000 model and then we have apparently checkpoints inside of it. LCD, CPU1, CPU2, UMD network, gadget and service, and memory stick. Then it moves on to 2000, 3000, the PSP Go, and then what I assume is the E1000. And then in chapter two, it starts going through all the games that have been released all the way from 2004 when the console was first released, all the way to the last game that was released back in 2016. The first thing it talks about right here is how it came about to creating the most beautiful and sleek handheld. Then right here it talks about the battle it had with the DS. And finally right here it talks about the demise of dedicated handheld gaming consoles that we all know came about through smartphones. Right here we got the usual spec sheet that you see when the console was first released. You know, the name of the console, the type of CPU it was using, and all the little details that we all came about to love about this console. And then this is when things get really exciting. And it still excites me to this day to see something like this. It's a complete catalog of nearly every single accessory, PSP color variant, different ads, different photo shots, a bunch of cool screenshots that really throw you back to the good old days. It doesn't even end there. We got awesome screenshots of the motherboard, the CPU, in-depth details about the GPU and the CPU. And then we got something here I've never heard about, which is NURBS. Let me uh, see what that is. Several attempts that have been made in the PSP's GPU that are not included in the PlayStation 2, making it possible to produce expressions comparable to those of the PlayStation 2. For those hearing this for the first time, when the PSP was first released, it was compared to the PlayStation 2 because in terms of graphics and capabilities, with the type of games that were included in a screen this size, it was pretty much considered as the PlayStation 2 handheld. That was later replaced with the Vita, that was eventually considered to be a PlayStation 3 portable. And as many of you know, the Vita is truly an awesome handheld. Unfortunately, Sony didn't know how to handle it and execute it correctly. It had a lot of potential, great hardware, Hardware, great software, but unfortunately, there wasn't enough games released for this thing. Which, although it had some amazing AAA games, the PSP, in my opinion, still had the better overall catalog. Oh, this is interesting. He's got some information about the LCD, which, if you're a viewer of this channel, you would know I have made a video comparing pretty much all the different IPS screens with every single PSP model's original screen. And this is actually some key information that I've been looking for and interested to find out. And luckily, this just came in. So right here, it talks about how it's actually using an ASV screen, which is the first time I'm hearing about this. And apparently, that stands for Advanced Super V, which then, in the next sentence, it talks about how it overcame the viewing angle problem back in 2004. Which means back then, of course, at the time, back in 2004, the standards at the time were different. Most of the LCD screens that were released were probably TFT, they looked horrible, and they had horrible viewing angles. The one I currently have in my hand is an IPS screen, which has superior viewing angles, especially compared to the one that was included originally. So if you do want more information about these things, you can watch my video about it. I'll leave it in the description down below. Here it talks about the UMD and how it held not only games, but also music and videos. And this is a very interesting article right here if you're a Walkman fan. Without going into too much detail, it pretty much talks about the built-in audio hardware that was packed into this thing to turn it into a beast of a media device. I mean, we're only on page 18, and I'm just blown away with the detail that this thing goes into. Of course, I'm having to use my phone to actually translate these things, but nonetheless, it's still very awesome to look at and really flip through the whole thing. Which, personally, to be honest, I'm not much of a magazine guy. I just tend to look at pictures and move on. But the information that is packed into here is absolutely unmatched. We got networking, we got the infrared sensor, the GPS module, the memory card, the built-in comic book reader, the camera app, the TV module. So right here we got the TV module called the One Seg, which is the frequency band that the off-air Japanese networks use. And uh, it looks really awesome. And it actually does still work to this day if you're in Japan. There's actually another one called the DMB, which is the exact same, except it's for the Korean networks. And if I ever visit, I'm definitely bringing one of these things with me. As a kid, I've been really intrigued by off-the-air TV networks. Here we have the camera module, and there's two cameras, but this is being the better one. It's a full metal body, it looks awesome, and eventually we'll have a dedicated video about it, so uh, stay tuned. Finally, we have the GPS module, and uh, where I am right now in the world, I cannot use it, but at some point, I'll definitely be trying it out. Time for another sip. Absolutely amazing. So now we move on to the 2000 model. This time we have double the RAM, 
but it's split into two different banks. And this is really cool. It actually has a comparison between the 1000 and 2000 models. It shows you the shape from different angles, different areas. Even the batteries are compared as well as the UMD doors. And that's pretty damn awesome if you ask me. Right here we got all the different color variants. And uh, my favorite one out of these things would have to be the Monster Hunter. Being this one right here. In my opinion, for the 2000 model, compared to all the other ones, it has the most unique look and feel. Then we have the 3000, which uh, is pretty much a 2000, plus a microphone and a few different things, including a better LCD. And when the 3000 came along, that's when Sony really went all out when it comes to color variants. I mean, they have absolutely killed it when it comes to different special models out here. Here we have the One Piece, which I'll eventually get my hands on at some point. Then we have ourselves the PSP Go. Same specs, same speed, but with a more compact form factor, no UMD. They decided to go all digital media and left behind every single person that had a UMD. It did include 16 gigabytes of built-in storage, which was pretty impressive at the time, but nowadays, it's only enough for a handful of games. That being said, when this thing released, it was insane. Not only had video out, like the 2000 and 3000 models, but it also had support for Bluetooth and DualShock 3 controllers, which when paired up with a TV dock, pretty much turned this thing into a Nintendo Switch. Way before the Switch was ever a thing. And at the time, it only released in two different colors, black and white, which to this day, in good condition, they still look pretty clean. And there have been a couple unreleased prototype colors in the past, but those happen to be just very rare to find. Kind of how this dock right here actually cost more than the console itself. And it seems like it pretty much skips over the E1000 model. It doesn't even mention it at all. But with that being said, it seems like we're reaching the end. Here we have all the different accessories. We got the various earbuds right down here, dedicated microphone accessories, the PSP Go dock, a Bluetooth media controller, and one accessory that I'm still looking out for is actually the S410. That happens to have a wireless remote control that interfaces with your PSP 2000 or 3000 model, essentially giving you the triggers, face buttons, D-pad, and the media buttons. However, there is no analog control, but I think there's something to dig into. And the reason I want to get it is actually to capture the signals that go through the bottom serial port. Yes, the PSP has a serial port right down here. And I think it just might be possible to create a plug and play wireless controller module using an Arduino that lets you pair up any Bluetooth controller and have access to those buttons that are included with this accessory. So that's a project for a future video. Here we have all the different batteries and the extended battery versions, which allow you to use the big fat battery from the 1000 on the slim models. And finally, some special edition Memory Stick Pro Duo cards. There's actually one more missing here and that would be the Monster Hunter edition, but uh, it seems like they missed it. Then we got some lanyards and pouches, some accessory pack bundles, and it seems like a list of the release dates of each model alongside with the compatibility with each PSP model. Then we have a segment that talks about the PlayStation Store, and it seems like they had some kind of desktop application similar to iTunes for the iPhone, where it kind of acts like a multimedia manager. Here it talks about remote play, and how the PlayStation Store is indirectly being shared by the PSP and the PS Vita, where you can buy one game and you can play it on both platforms. And right here we got something called the UMD Passport. And basically it's a program that gave you a discount on the PlayStation Store for games that you own physically. So yeah, imagine having a big catalog and then you have to buy that all over again. But hey, you get a discount, right? Oh, there it is. So we got the A1000 Black Edition, the white version, and the Xperia Play. Thankfully, they didn't miss it. Uh, let's see what they say about it here. Yeah, it kind of just glosses over it. Uh, nothing really special. Let's go ahead and finally take a look at the game section. Cool, so here we have it. Whoops. So right here we have a glossary on how to read the different catalog games. Basically, they all have cards, and uh, inside of them, they have a bunch of different labels and layouts. So this page explains how to read it with all the different legends. Here it talks about the graphics engine, the wide variety of games, and the rise of GAL games. It talks about how the PSP platform was the ideal platform for porting games from the PS2 to the PSP. So, let's go ahead and finally take a look at the wide variety of games here. Now one of course can just go online, look at a video montage and look at some popular games. Or you can get yourself a catalog and browse the endless list of nearly every single game ever released on the PSP. That has a mix of Japanese and Western media. It starts out in 2004 and moves all the way up to 2016. But essentially we got like Ridge Racer, we got Formula Front, various different fighting games, golf. And is that really all that was released back in 2004? Where's Wipeout? 2005, we got Bleach, Need for Speed, and there it is, that's Wipeout. Horse Racing, Lupin the Third, Slot Machine? And just looking at these game cards, it's quite literally eye candy to my eyes. I'm having an absolute blast just going through these pages. What I gotta do is like sit down, flip through these pages, have a notebook on hand, and take note of the games I wanna take a look at, because some of these Japanese games are still being translated. Just as awesome as one of my favorite recent games, Sega Rally Revo. I mean, this game looks amazing. It's like 400 megabytes, and the graphics fidelity are absolutely gorgeous. You know, a lot of Mojang games were released back then. A lot of hidden gems, that's for sure. And not to mention the lifetime supply of visual novels. Oh, there's Tekken 6, all the way in 2010. Explains why it's a great port, as it looks amazing. Here we have SOCOM, which by the way, there is still an online community that plays daily. 
and uh, there's various ways of doing it. And yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff in here. Lots of weird games that you probably would never pick up or look at. And I'm not even talking about the obvious ones, I'm talking about like this, which is the game where you have a knife and you go between your fingers. We got Fate Extra, Miku, Monster Hunter 3rd right here, one of the biggest ones released. 2011, a ton more visual novels, action games, Steins Gate, bunch of romance visual novels by the way, especially near the end around 2012. Kamen Rider, 2011, 2013, more visual novels, more visual novels. I mean, just take a look at this. Then we got a great one, God Eater 2, 2014, some more visual novels. And finally, we get to 2016, some more visual novels. All right. And, huh. Where's that game I was thinking about? Did I miss it? So there's supposed to be one more game that was released back in 2016, and it's from the Western market, and that would be Retro City Rampage. Yes, there were some Western games mixed in here, which my bad was not a thousand, it was 801. The majority of them were Japanese games. It would have been nice if they cataloged the Western games, but oh well. And that's pretty much it. I gotta say, I had an absolute blast going through this booklet. Just a ton of fun eye candy. A lot of interesting facts and information about each console. Specifically for me, the display specs. I was very interested to see what the original specifications were on plain paper, and this catalog has answered that for me. So I'm pretty happy. A couple things I wish it had are either higher resolution pictures or pictures that are twice as big. But of course, if they did that, the booklet will be twice as thick. Overall, would I recommend picking this up? I would say absolutely yes. I would say this is a fantastic addition if you're a collector. It's got a ton of eye candy, tons of information, but just keep in mind that it mostly focuses on the Japanese games. And other than that, guys, that is pretty much it for this video. I would say this was a $50 well spent. I'm definitely gonna be opening this booklet up later when I have more time, just to take notes of the games that I'm interested in, to see if they have any English translations and just kind of explore some old uh, forgotten media. So yeah, that is all for this video. Thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed this video and found it helpful, hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care, everyone.